Okay, um, welcome everybody. So with me I have Ms. Sean Sylvester. She spoke at a massive outreach event that we held at the EWB 2010 National Conference earlier today. Um, this massive outreach event reached over 4,300 students across Newfoundland and Labrador. During her presentation, during the questions and answers, students emailed and texted in uh, questions for her. There were an abundance of over 200 questions, which was amazing. And unfortunately, we weren't able to answer all of them, so she's graciously accepted to take this opportunity to answer a couple more from you all, or a few more. So we're going to go through a couple of them and um, give some responses. Great. So thanks for agreeing to do this. I'm happy to, Amy. Okay, so the first one is just to set the mood of it. So this question comes from Ryan and Claire um, from St. Bonds. Um, they just want to know what can students do to help teens in developing countries? That's a good question um, from St. Boniface. So I think there's a few things as Canadians. Uh, one is get to know some teenagers from another country. Uh, perhaps start through uh, an organization developing links and developing relationships. And there are a lot of programs in which you and your schools can fundraise to support various groups. There's certainly Engineers Without Borders, there's Op World of Opportunity with Engineers Without Borders. Free the Children also has opportunities to fundraise to build schools in certain, in certain uh, African villages particularly. There's a whole range of groups out there. And your school can start to get involved. If you find a community within a, a context and you want to get involved with them, you can, you can do that yourselves. Um, it's always good to have non-government organization helping you though. The other thing I would do is um, make a point of, just in your conversations, really addressing stereotypes. I think we often have assumptions about people in other countries that we don't know much about, and it's really important to just address those stereotypes and you know, ask questions about who are they, what do they like to read, what kind of music, what kind of dancing do they do. See them as human beings rather than starving kids in Africa, as an example. Great, thanks. So as a turnaround on that, we have got a couple of questions. So one of them was, what have been some effective method methods that you have seen apathy turn into actions? And where's that question coming from? Uh, they did not provide. Oh, okay. But so whoever asked, question. it's a great, how do you turn apathy into action? We often talk about an arc of taking somebody that doesn't know much about an, um, an issue, and you take them through this arc up from awareness to education, to judgment, to advocating, to action. And that's a big arc for people to go through. And so many campaigns try and get people that know nothing about an issue straight to action. And that's really hard to do. So you have to develop campaigns that take people from where they're at. And it might be just raising their awareness. It might be educating them more on an issue. It might get them to a stage where they'll come to judgment on that issue. Or advocate their own position, what they think. And then that point of action um, really comes when people feel really compelled to act. So how do you move apathy? Um, you go with where people are at and, and, and work with them and on their terms rather than just sort of insisting on how they should act. The action has to really come from people's hearts and souls and, and they're not going to do it just because you ask them to do it. Mm -hmm. it. So it's really important to engage them wherever they're at in that. Okay. Uh, another one that kind of spins off it that we also don't know where they came from, they ask, uh, I feel passionate about global issues, but I've got trouble getting my friends to care. Yeah. So what can I do to get them to think like me or kind of in that mindset? That's a, that's a good question, and I know a lot, particularly high school students are going through this because they might be in a class where, you know, global issues comes up and there's only one other person that expresses any interest. Um, one of the things that, that my daughter did is she took a friend uh, to the Me to We Day that mm -hmm. Free the Children had, which had a real focus on um, music and, you know, and, and, and so a person that didn't really care at all about international issues was so turned on by what was going on at that event that they got more involved. Um, I think it's important to make the global issues fun, make it interesting. Uh, if you're trying to drag somebody off to, you know, um, a lecture, it may not happen. But if you go and say to your friend, let's go for coffee, but let's, or not go for coffee, let's go for hot chocolate. 
But let's make sure that we get their trade hot chocolate. Let's see what that is and then start the conversation. What does that mean? And um, maybe then slowly share stories. That's a start. Um, my, the other thing my daughter does, because she has this problem as well, she's mm -hmm. in grade nine, and uh, is she finds kids in other schools as well. So she, okay. when she goes to other events, she meets these kids and then they get involved. Okay, so uh, we've got a question from Twillingate, Newfoundland, Labrador. So Twillingate is, was one of the communities that we didn't actually get to visit for the MOE event, but they did see the, the presentation that you gave. So it's really cool that they can answer it. That's great. Yeah, Thanks so, for the questions. So a comment that you just made was students getting in touch with other people from other schools. So um, in the province here, in rural communities, some people, there aren't so many other schools around them. So people in Tulligate, for example, they want to know, what can we do in rural communities? That's a great that. question. Now it's interesting, I actually find in rural communities, um, kids tend to get more involved. Mm -hmm. And they tend, there's more of a, I'm actually from a small town, and, and there's, you know, when, when things would happen, more of us would go to them, because it was the thing that was happening in town. So it's, yeah. I actually often find the real leadership comes from rural communities especially if you're talking about agricultural pro projects. or So I'm not sure that the challenge is as big, but there's lots of ways for, maybe you are alone, maybe there isn't anybody in your community that cares about these issues. So you need to get connected through the internet because there are so many groups. Taking it global is was started by Jennifer Carrero and a friend when they were 17 or 18 years old, and it's now grown into the biggest social network of young people in the world. And it's a way of young people getting connected on global issues, talking about them, connecting with other kids. It's a whole kind of social networking site for the globally conscious young person. And so in Twillingate, if you don't know about taking a global, get connected with that. But also get connected with EWB's website. Get connected with Free the Children. Um, apathy is boring. They've all got websites. They've all got things that they'd like you to do to be involved with them. Yeah, I can give a little plug for the EWB one. It's just youth.ewb.ca, and I know they've got plenty of actions on the site that you can take part in. Um, so one of the actions that you said is taking your friend to a coffee shop and get a cup of fair trade coffee. So Alyssa Lehman from Holy Harbor Mary High School says that she doesn't really know what fair trade is. So could you give us just a brief example or a description? Sure. Many, many years ago, I started a little cooperative, a fair trade cooperative called Trade Roots. It was kind of fun. This was a long time ago. And basically the idea of fair trade is that you're, you're making decisions as a consumer to purchase things where people are paid a fair wage for what they're purchasing. So they're actually, there's, there's an idea that, that the, the producer, whether it's coffee or chocolate, that there's some ethics around how that product is produced. And, and a big part of that ethics is that the people are fairly compensated for their work. So we're not exploiting them. So fair trade, you can often find a label on fair trade coffee or fair mm -hmm. trade chocolate. Uh, Coco Camino is a perfect example of a cooperative that is fair trade. They just deal with fair trade products. So look for that label. My uh, cousin who lives in Toronto, um, when she was, in, I guess she was 12 years old, she just went to her parents and said, I'm not going to eat any chocolate unless it's fair trade. And at that time, it wasn't as easy to get fair trade chocolate as it is now. You can get it online, you can get it in a lot of different mm -hmm. places. So making decisions, you can also get clothes that are fair trade. Uh, I, I'm on the board of Mountain Equipment Co-op. Oh, cool. And one of the things we're really trying to do is, is move to that. We're not there yet by any stretch. It's very hard. But we're trying to move to a place where um, we really reduce our ecological footprint in the, in, in the kind of clothes that we make and recycled uh, cottons and things like that. So we're trying to find ways of building in our, all of our practices ethical behavior. Um, it, it, it's hard. It's not easy, uh, especially in, in, in looking at clothes, but mm -hmm. it can be done. 